A typical songbird population, only 50% of the individuals survive from one year to the next. Half of the population dies during migration, winter, nesting each year. So a pair of nesting birds has to produce two adult offspring just to keep the population stable. Out of those four, two birds will come back the next year. So with that much attrition, you can see that small disturbances in the, the whole system can have a really big impact. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with David Sibley. David is an ornithologist, author, and illustrator of a series of successful guides to nature that bear his name, including his bestseller, The Sibley Guide to Birds. He's also the author of Birds of Cape May, Hawks in Flight, The Sibley Guide to Trees, and Sibley's Birding Basics. His latest book is What It's Like to Be a Bird. He is also the recipient of the Roger Torrey Peterson Award from the American Birding Association for promoting the cause of birding and the Linnaean Society of New York's Heisman Medal. He lives in birds in Massachusetts. David, welcome to the podcast. I don't know of anyone who's done more to bring birding closer and make it more understandable to so many in very practical ways. And through my wife, Wendy, who is the birder in the family, I have really enjoyed the opportunity to bird with you and learn from you. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Before diving in, let's start at the beginning. You're the son of a Yale ornithologist, so it runs in the family. Tell our audience a bit about your upbringing and how it launched a life devoted to birds. Thanks, Hank. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast with you and always fun to talk about birds. So yeah, my father is an ornithologist and uh, was the curator of birds at, at the museum at Yale. And I think I was a kid with an interest in birds. I, I meet these kids now all over the country, parents who say, our son or daughter has memorized the bird guide. They're only eight years old and we want to encourage this. What can we do? And I have a feeling I was one of those kids. Maybe it runs in the family. <laughs> and had the good fortune of having a father who is an ornithologist. So all kinds of opportunities were opened up and, uh, you know, just hanging out with graduate students, doing things behind the scenes, helping out with projects, traveling on museum expeditions, all those things I got to do as a kid. And it just broadened my birding horizons so much, it gave me such a, such a head start, such an education in, in birding, even before I left high school. Wow. And then you went from, from high school to college, but you left college after your first year. Talk a bit about that and what led to that. I don't assume your father really welcomed that. How yeah. did that all happen and how did it, it come down? Yeah, my parents were not happy about that, but uh, I think they weren't surprised either. I had tried to talk them into uh, letting me take a gap year. We didn't call it a gap year back then in 1979, but I wanted to take time off between high school and college to just go birding, and they didn't really go for that. So I started college, but I, I already had my mind set on just birding, illustrating, learning to draw birds, illustrating birds, and in the back of my mind was the idea of doing a field guide. And I wanted to, wanted to practice my drawing, I wanted to study birds in the field, and none of that was happening in college. So I got a job counting hawks at Cape May Bird Observatory, Cape May, New Jersey. So what would have been my sophomore year at college, I, in the summer, I told my parents, I'm not going back, but I have a job <laughs> watching birds. <laughs> I remember sitting at Cape May and, you know, getting very confused by size and a butterfly would fly in and I thought I saw a bird and fascinating experience for the hawk migration. And so you spent a lot of time in the field. So you started to get into this, but at what point did you merge your interest in birds with your talent as an artist? Because you're a talented artist. And how did these two activities uh, complement each other? For me, they have always gone together. I heard Robert Bateman 
It is a great quote. He said, um, all kids are naturalists and artists, and some of us just never stop. <laughs> and I just, I enjoyed drawing from a very young age. My favorite subject when I was like five years old was dinosaurs, which we know now are actually the predecessors of birds. So, And about when I was about six or seven years old, I, I started drawing more birds. But the thing about drawing is it's really a way of understanding something. It's It forces you to look at something very carefully and look at every, really understand every part of it, the shape, the arrangement of colors and patterns. So drawing was such a complement to birding. I learned so much by drawing, it made me better at birding. And the more I went birding, the more I looked at birds, the better I was at drawing. So the, the two things always kind of supported and complemented each other. And I've always kind of thought of them as the same parts of the same, same thing. For sure. And, you know, you published your landmark field guide for uh, North American birders. You spent at least 12 years traveling, birding, drawing, painting birds throughout the U.S. So you did all that before you published your first bird guide. And tell us how that work led to the Sibley Field Guide for Birds, which together with the companion field guides to the birds of Eastern and Western North America have sold over a million copies. Amazing, over a million copies. And yet you spent 12 years in the field. Tell us how this came about and how you had this opportunity finally to publish that book. Yeah, well, it was my my passion, obviously. I And in those days, I had no no idea that it would sell so well. I thought it would be my career writing and illustrating field guides, as unrealistic as that might might sound. To me, it always seemed very realistic, and that was my goal. But I never imagined the books would sell as well as they have. But for me, those 12 years, I was traveling, living in a camper van, a very small budget, and just watching birds 360 days a year, every morning getting up wherever I was, walking out with my sketchbook and my binoculars and watching and sketching birds. And that, I mean, that was a wonderful time. And I loved every minute of that, just learning about the birds and seeing them and, and getting better. I could tell my, my sketches were getting better every day. And all I was doing then was pencil drawings. Watch a bird for half an hour and spend two minutes or three minutes doing some drawing. It was mostly just studying, kind of taking it all in. But all of that came back in the field guide because I knew then, I knew all the variations of the birds. I had a very well-developed sense of what they looked like and their shapes and postures and colors, the differences between species. And um, when I then got back to the studio in the 1990s and actually started doing all the paintings that would appear in the book. A lot of those are based on my field sketches, or a lot of that work is based on the field sketches. All of it depends on my experience that I gained during those years. And I, I always say that the, the most important part of a bird illustration is the, the outline. If you get the outline of the bird right, the paint just kind of falls into place. Everything fits. If any part of the outline is wrong, if the head's too big, the neck's too long, the wings aren't in the right position, any part, then the markings won't fit and it. You just can't fix it with paint. <laughs> the outline has to be right. So it's amazing. I've watched you sketch birds and uh, it's just amazing how quickly you can do it. But I guess if you've done it enough, you can do it quickly. So then you had this great opportunity having all the paintings and it came together and you published a book. And what distinguishes your guides for me is exactly what you said, the way you capture the distinctive postures, shapes, and colors of hard to distinguish species, particularly when dealing with males, females, and immatures. And the other point that really stands out to me is you point the birder to sometimes very subtle field marks, which help distinguish a bird from others of very similar appearance. So tell us a bit about how your guide works and how a distinguishing field mark can help solve an identification puzzle. Well, during that 12 years that I was traveling and just sketching and studying birds, I was also thinking about the field guide, especially later on during those years. And it took me a long time, but I 
settled on the idea that the the key thing that a field guide does is allow comparisons between species. So your bird identification is all about pattern recognition. It's something our brains do very well, and it's just seeing a pattern and matching it to something that where it fits. I wanted to create just sort of a, a visual catalog of the birds, and and uh, then I came up with the plan of really stripping away everything except the birds themselves. So all of my birds in the field guide are on a white background. They're all facing the same direction. They're all in a 90 degree perpendicular profile. They're all in sort of neutral poses, just resting. It's all designed to make them as sort of neutral as possible so that what you see on the page will, you can sort of superimpose your own experience in the field onto that. And I'm getting a a little philosophical about illustration here, but it's what photographs can't do that because a photograph is always a record of an instant in one bird's life. There's a story. A photograph always tells a story. It's got some narrative of what was happening at that moment. And in the illustrations, I can strip all of that away. So when if you see a bird, whether it's in the snow or fog or wind or sun, you can look at an illustration and you can match whatever your experience was and kind of superimpose the story onto the illustration where the, the photograph, you have to kind of mentally strip away the, the narrative part of that and then figure out if, if your bird that was maybe seen in the snow <laughs> matches the photograph that was taken in bright sun. Uh, those kinds of ideas were kind of filtering through my head as I was leading up to the work of doing the field guide. And then I finally settled on the, the idea of just a very grid, sort of a grid pattern in the book of all the birds arranged in a similar way on each page. So it's easy to compare any species, any plumage with any other, making all of the illustrations as uh, easy for comparison as possible. I can tell an anecdote. I remember birding with you on a southeastern Georgia barrier island, where one of the larger and most common sandpipers is a willet, right? And one flies up and I say, oh, a willet. And you say a Western willet. Well, I didn't know there was anything other than a willets we had there. And it turns out they're quite rare and you saw some field marks. So how did you know that was a Western willet? Give us that example or any other one. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the great things about bird, birding. It's puzzle solving. It's And it keeps presenting new puzzles. So the, the subspecies of willet, or it's possibly, I think, likely two different species of willets. They're really different. The Western ones come from the Great Plains, and a lot of them migrate east to the Atlantic coast. Um, they're a little bit bigger than the, the Atlantic coast breeding population, a little bit paler overall, the bill's a little longer. So like the one we saw on in Georgia was in non-breeding plumage, so it's going to be very pale gray all over, a lot more white on the breast than the Eastern ones have, longer bill, longer legs. Just there's subtle differences, but taken all together, they make a, a distinctive appearance. And yeah, it's things like that. And I still discover new new details all the time that you, know, you need to distinguish species often at a great distance. So figuring out what distinguishing features you can see at a distance or in silhouette, these are all slightly different scenarios that you have to deal with in bird identification. And each one, you can use different clues. Well, David, another thing I love about you is you're always breaking new ground. And your latest book sure does that. It's an absolute gem. What it's like to be a bird. In that book, you include all sorts of interesting facts and details of over 200 species, alongside more than 330 beautiful illustrations. And it's just a fascinating book. And what motivated you to write this book? Well, this one... It started out as an idea for a children's book. After the field guide came out, I, a lot of people talked to me about doing a children's guide to birds, and I, I thought about it for years and um, started working on it. And I wanted to show you know, really fun, action-packed paintings of the birds, along with interesting facts about them, to introduce kids to this amazing world of the birds. So I, I set about trying to answer some of the most common questions that people ask about birds. And as I did the research for those questions, I kept learning new things, discovering that what I thought I knew was wrong, and the real answer was so much more interesting. And 
the more I worked on it, the more that research just kind of took over and it, it became a collection of questions and answers about birds, trying to touch on a lot of the most interesting, most amazing things that birds do. And I tried to write it at a, at a very general level for non-birders, basically. And I know it's, it's still a book that really science-minded kids, 10 or 12-year-olds, can read and enjoy. So it's not exactly the kids book that I set out to do, but I think it appeals to uh, all ages. And there is actually a um, kind of middle school level edition that's in the works now that should be out soon. Well, I tell you, that one is a big, beautiful book. You know, I can look at a page or two and uh, almost any species group and learn something. So to me, what's marvelous about you is you're a first-rate ornithologist, but you're not an academic ornithologist. You're a field ornithologist. You know as much about American bird behaviors as anyone because you spend so much time, so much of your life observing birds from a very rare common robin. The last time I was with you, I was amazed. You're looking at this bird so carefully. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it's a robin. I moved from a robin, but so looking at a robin to the much rarer species of wood warblers. And what I love about the book is that you answer every question that people might think to ask about birds. Again, not from an academic perspective, but in very understandable terms. We could be here for days if I ask you all of the interesting questions which are answered in this book. But let's do a quick round of some of them. So to begin with, you said you learned a lot. So you spent years researching and writing this book. What did you learn that you didn't know before? I learned that ground nesting birds like killdeer and ducks, um, grouse, they when they're sitting on their nest incubating eggs, and the chemical composition of the oil that they preen into their feathers changes at that season to something that is odorless, undetectable by predators like foxes or raccoons. So all those species are really well camouflaged visually. Their feathers are camouflaged, but they're also camouflaged by smell. And uh, the researchers tested this by <laughs> putting samples of the different, the two different kinds of preen oil, breeding season and non-breeding season, into a big warehouse area and letting some dogs loose in there. The dogs found all the winter season preen oil and not the breeding season preen oil. So, and that, I, I was just blown away by that. And I always, had always heard my whole life that when birds sleep, they crouch down on their perch and the, the crouching motion, bending their ankle, automatically contracts the tendons in their toes. They, they clamp onto the branch and that's how they hang on while they sleep. But actually, they don't grip the branch while they sleep. There is no automatic clamping mechanism in their toes. They simply balance. And that was mind blowing and pretty amazing. And then I found out that they actually, one of the things that helps them balance like that is that they have an extra balance sensor in their pelvis. So we have, we only balance with the semicircular canals in our inner ear and birds have that also. They've got a balance sensor in their inner ear, but another one in their pelvis. So they can monitor the movement, the balance of their body and their head separately, which gives them a lot of advantages for things like perching on a twig while they're sleeping. So, and yeah, just so much more. So let's go to another common one. The kids ask all the time, how is it the birds are able to fly? What is it about their anatomy that allows them to take flight? A big question, but almost everything about a bird's anatomy and a lot of their physiology is adapted for flight. Feathers, obviously, are a huge part of what makes flight possible. But even if we had feathers, we wouldn't be able to fly like birds do because we're all unbalanced. So birds have, they've got feathers, they've got lightweight and, well, unusually stiff bone structure. It turns out their bones are not particularly lightweight. A bird's skeleton is about the same weight as the skeleton of a mammal of the same size, a non-flying mammal like a mouse. But their bones are, the bone tissue is very dense. The bones are very strong and very rigid. Um, so they can have these long slender bones that are no heavier than the bones of a mammal. And then their whole body all of their muscles and sort of 
body function, the flesh and bones of a bird is all centralized in a very compact body mass, which is balanced right underneath the wings. So it's one of the reasons birds don't have teeth, because teeth are heavy, and the teeth would be out in the front of the head, sticking out way in front of the bird, and, and cause it to be unbalanced while it flies. So instead, birds swallow their food whole. The chewing process happens in their stomach, the gizzard, and um, all of that still is balanced. So a bird can have a big meal and then take off immediately afterwards, and the all of the food that it's just taken in, which only took it a few seconds to swallow, is still balanced like that. And their respiratory system is incredibly efficient, and it's just um, there's there's a lot more the the balance sensors being able to monitor air currents and and movement of the body to track their uh, their flight to be very efficient. They also even their vision birds process visual information more than twice as fast as we do. So that helps them when they're flying very quickly, weaving around foliage and other obstacles helps them to uh, make those very quick flight adjustments. So, so much of what birds do is, is modified for flight. Continuing right on from there, let's talk about the wonder of a bird's feathers. How are they constructed? Are the gorgeous, sometimes iridescent colors a result of pigment or the way they refract light? Yeah, feathers are just incredible. And there's been a lot of a lot of research recently on the structure of feathers and kind of the the bioengineering looking at feathers and how they function and all of the adaptations that have gone into that and thinking about how that could inform some of our our own human engineering yeah feathers they're incredibly light but also very strong and the shape of the feather shaft changes for example along its length so round at the base, which makes it resistant to flexing in any direction, but square or rectangular farther out, so it can flex up and down or side to side, but not, not in the other directions. And they, I mean, the colors of feathers also are just amazing. So some of the colors, the brown, black, gray, buff, and all of the red to yellow range of colors, those are all pigments. But anything blue or bright green or really iridescent bright red or the sort of iridescent sheen on like the head of a mallard or the feathers of a common grackle, those are all depend on the structure of the surface of the feather, not pigment. So there's melanin in there. There's black pigment, which has a role to play in all of that. But it's a, it's a very complex interaction of light waves with the structure of the feather that reinforces some light waves, some particular colors, and other wavelengths of light are absorbed by the feather or, or even in, in some cases, like in the hummingbirds, those iridescent colors, some light waves are just canceled out. Bouncing off of multiple surfaces of the feather and the waves that come out are out of phase, so they cancel each other out the same way if you, um, like if you put your hand in a, in a tub of water and shake it back and forth quickly, you get so many waves going in so, so many different directions, they kind of cancel each other out. So, and then if you move your hand slowly back and forth in time with the waves, you get one big wave. That's kind of what the hummingbird feathers do with light waves. And they amplify one wavelength, one pure color, and all the other wavelengths are, are canceled out. So, yeah, and how that kind of thing evolves, it's just uh, hard to imagine. Amazing. And you know what? We could go on and on. People are going to have to get the book to get answers to some of the other questions. But I remember as you, you talk about hummingbirds, when Wendy and I are with you in, in Montana this summer, you showed us the calliope hummingbird, right? The smallest bird in the U.S. Ten of them weigh a total of one ounce. It's just hard to, to imagine that. And you know, all kinds of other questions about birds hearing, about the sight, about how birds, really small little birds like chickadees, can winter in the sub-zero boreal forest and survive through the nights. Yeah. Fascinating questions. But uh, I want to move from there and zoom out a bit to a very big question. Bird populations are in a dramatic decline in North America and all over the world. 
One major study from science showed that the total number of birds in North America has dropped by 3 billion birds since 1970. The biodiversity extinction crisis is moving at warp speed. And of course, much of the decline in birds is attributable to destruction of their habitat and food sources like insects, which is magnified by some of the things you've written about in your book. For instance, talk about the normal survival rates for birds in the first year and how this impacts some of the broader issues driving biodiversity decline. Also, talk a bit about how window panes and house cats, which are allowed to roam outside, impact our dwindling bird population. There's more and more evidence supporting the there's the impression that a lot of longtime bird watchers have that there just aren't quite as many birds as there used to be. And some species are doing well and increasing many species are declining and that big study from a few years ago showed that three billion birds about 30 percent of the total north american population have uh, disappeared since 1970 and that yeah the one of the things i i included in in the book what it's like to be a bird is a, a sort of a population graph just for an, an average songbird and it surprised me when i was researching that and that a typical songbird population only 50 percent of the individuals survive from one year to the next half of the population dies during migration winter nesting each year so a pair of nesting birds has to produce two adult young adult offspring just to keep the population stable. Every nesting pair has to produce on average two young to keep the population going. And out of those four, two birds will come back the next year. So with that much attrition, you can see that small disturbances in the, the whole system can have a really big impact. If there's a, a bad breeding season, if there was such a catastrophic breeding season that say no Baltimore Orioles produced young one summer, only half as many Baltimore Orioles would be back to nest the next year. And it would take a long time for the population to recover from something like that. So things that we know that window glass on houses and, and office buildings kills a lot of birds every year. And, and house cats that are outdoors kill a lot of birds. And these are things that there are really simple solutions for. and um, something that people can do in their own backyard to help birds. The estimates now are that cats are the biggest single predator of birds, or the single biggest human impact on bird populations, and Windows second, uh, distant second. So really quickly, what does someone do? A bird hits their window pane, is stunned outside. What does someone do with that bird? Yeah, if it's still alive, um, put it in a in a cardboard box or even just a paper bag with the top folded over someplace dark and secure. Um, you don't need to give it any water or food or anything. Just um, give it a quiet, dark place to recover. And hopefully within an hour or two, you'll hear it kind of scratching around inside the bag or box and then take it outside before you open it. <laughs> don't peek in indoors, but take it outside, open it, and hopefully the bird will fly away. The, many of them recover enough to fly away um, and and then look into some uh, products. The American Bird Conservancy has uh, really good information about avoiding window strikes. There's tape and other products that you can apply to your window that makes it more visible to the birds. They see a reflection of the outside world and they think they can fly right through in, into that reflected image. So if you put strips of narrow strips of tape or strings, something to break up that reflection, the birds won't try to fly through it. And, and then you won't have to deal with that anymore. And, and that can make a big difference. Now, let's talk about some practical solutions. What steps can listeners take to support their local birds? Well, the uh, keeping cats indoors, treating your windows to make them more visible to the birds so they don't birds don't crash into them. Those are two of the big things. Supporting organic farms. Pesticides are a big issue for birds, and especially the, the very sterile industrial agriculture that goes on now with no weedy edges, hedgerows, and no insects, very few insects in the in the fields. So organic produce, local farms, getting involved with your local local land trust, local um, conservation groups, 
and planting native plants in your own backyard. If if 10% of the lawn area of the United States was turned into productive native shrubs like dogwood and viburnum, uh, it would be a boon for birds. That And that's something you can everyone can do in their own neighborhood, their own backyard. For sure. And one of the things that Wendy has done in our neighborhood is gone around, knocked on farmers, people's doors where they have hay fields and beg them not to mow until early September, ideally mid-September, even if they could delay until late August, it would save many, many nesting birds, rare birds like bobolinks and dick thistles and so yeah. on. So that can make a big difference. So David, now I want to get to a last question. An irony that I see that is a very favorable development is that at a time when birds are under so much threat, there is a rapidly growing interest in birding in the U.S. and globally. I mean, you've really hit a wave right now, right? So as you can see, it was your bird guide sales. Many friends have told me that particularly during the COVID lockdowns, they took great pleasure in watching birds in their yards and at their feeders. So What's your advice for someone who's interested in becoming a birder or for a beginning birder who wants to rapidly advance? I definitely saw the same thing happening. I heard from so many people that during the pandemic lockdown, bird watching was a great pleasure. And I think that, that speaks to the, the real fundamental appeal of bird watching. I think it's a, it's a great escape from the daily stress and at the same time, a connection to something much bigger. So you get a kind of uh, best of <laughs> best of all of it there. But I think the um, for for a beginning birder, I think first getting getting out, looking at birds regularly, and and seeing them, uh, getting familiar with them, is the best way to advance. But really, um, being an active observer, and by that I mean being curious, asking questions, coming up with a hypothesis and testing it, and looking for patterns. Everything about birds follows patterns. A wren always acts like a wren. A thrush always sounds like a thrush. And then you can drill down to species beyond that, but everything fits into its sort of place in the natural order. And uh, that starting to recognize those things, looking for those patterns and and um, figuring those things out will uh, be a big, a big advance. So well said. And the one thing we didn't cover because there's so much to cover in this is birdsong. And to me, yeah. that's what fascinated me. I don't have great eyes, but riding horses with my dad when I was a kid and learning all the songs, that's a meadowlark, right? Yeah. That's Robin, that's an oriole. And beautiful songs and really a, a very interesting identification tool. So you've got the ears and the eyes. So, David, thank you. This has been a fascinating conversation, which should resonate not only with your many fans and avid birders, but to many others who want an informed introduction to birds and birding. And I always like to say birds and birding because it really gets me when people say, are you a bird watcher, right? All birders are bird watchers. David, thank you very much. Thank you, Hank. It's been a pleasure. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.